Welcome to the Clemson Dubcast. It is Thursday, March 16th. March Madness underway. I have not watched a minute of it because everything is being dominated by what happened last night in the NIT. Clemson basketball losing to Moorhead State. Just an embarrassing defeat. There's no way around that. At TigerIllustrated.com right now, there's a column for me basically saying all the talk about the eye test and now and uh, now uh, they didn't want to be there and the NIT is just really kind of bunk just in the grand scheme when you're thinking about where they are as a program and what the definition of success was identified as here in Brownell's Brad Brownell's 13th season. Anyway, check it out. My good friends Blake Smith and Brooke Archenhold have been part of the podcast since the beginning, way back in August of 2018. They have an accomplished team of personal injury attorneys at Parm Smith and Archenhold based in Greenville. They are Clemson people, and their skillful attorneys have decades of experience in complicated litigation matters, taking a special interest in medical malpractice, nursing home abuse, and neglect, car accident cases that have left the individuals involved in serious trouble. For a free consultation at Parm Smith and Archenhold, call 864-990-4581 or online at parhamlaw.com. That's P-A-R-H-A-M law.com. When you're ready for a complete renovation in your home or business, open the door to more with Harris Home and Harris Commercial. Their local experience team will totally transform any room space from beautiful floor coverings to construction to finished details. Harris handles every step of your renovation process, whether it's a kitchen or living room or an industrial or educational setting, like some of the positively stunning work they've done at Clemson University. Go to discoverharris.com and experience a total renovation transformation from Harris Home and Harris Commercial. Solero Communications, formerly known as Tandem Payment, is a full-service integrated electronic payments provider powered by leading-edge technology. Solero provides a wide array of merchant solutions, simplified payments. They make onboarding, taking payments, maintaining risk management and compliance, and getting support quick and easy. At Solero, they're all about helping you achieve sustainable growth as a business. Taking payments isn't the only thing your business needs. With Solero's solutions, You can manage inventory, sell products and services via social media, schedule staff, track sales, get reports, and much, much more. Find out more about Solero at solerocommerce.com. That's C-E-L-E-R-O commerce.com. Okay, three days ago, a cluster of reporters sat down with Graham Neff, who basically committed to Brad Brownell being here beyond this season. Obviously, a lot of people second-guessing that decision in the aftermath of the NIT loss. Moving forward, it's going to be really interesting to see how Graham, or if he uh, maybe rephrases it, walks it back, whatever, or, or maybe professes his 100% conviction that, that Brownell's the guy uh, moving forward. Anyway, thought it would be useful to provide the complete audio from that gathering with reporters on Monday afternoon, and apologies for my typing. It's very loud. I'm sorry. Here we go. Thanks for coming. Obviously, just a small group, select group, to be real honest. But just um, for you guys just to obviously talk on the um, on hoops and the frustration last night and obviously the program and Brad and all that, like very um, attuned. Um, and as I know all you guys are on just the season um, at large and, you know, kind of where we're at. And so appreciate you guys just huddling and talking through conversational again whatever q and a's and wherever we want to go with it i know you guys got football here in a little while so we can just run through some of that um and i know brad i just got some notes from jeff but i haven't seen all the the notes from brad's uh, time earlier with you guys but um share the frustration obviously of last night right and disappointment frustration is a good word um and just think we're a tournament team um, watch the games, resume, um, just how I view it. And that was the, the anticipation maybe going into the selection show, you know, and saw all the brackets, due diligence. So I know it was um, probably 50-50 proposition, but you just never know. Um, and so, therefore, for it to um, come through and us be on the wrong side of it, really, really frustrating. Um, it's just a good word. Um, educated hard over the past couple weeks um, with our staff, sort of from a media side of things, from committee, you know, constituents, from the ACC standpoint, as far as what our attributes were and like context for the season with with injuries and and conference non-conference scheduling. Obviously, has been a big point of discussion and circumstances around that. 
um, was was very much part of uh, the last couple of weeks. Certainly, my role, um, other staff members' role, and working through through the league and otherwise. And so, um, so I don't, I don't. I'm happy to, but I don't. I know. I think from what Brad talked about earlier, I don't need to chop up all of those nuances. I think he covered a lot of that. Um, but a lot of that, we are very, um, we have been very simpatico on just the, the perspective that Clemson's a tournament team should be in, should have been in, and therefore uh, the frustration and disappointment that, um, that we're not, you know, and, and, and there's a couple lenses to it. Obviously, ours is very um, focused on Clemson, but then you get into ACC and only five teams, second year in a row, last year ACC had five teams in and won 15 games, 14 or 15 games. Um, and so that that trend of two years in a row of only five teams in and, you know, the metrics and the net of our league, ultimately seemingly some of the brand or the, the um, just the, the, the prestige of, of ACC basketball is concerning, you know, where that's where that's at, at, you know, this year. And again, we're on the wrong side of it, along with North Carolina was obviously right there. Last year, Wake Forest was right there on the wrong side of it. And so that, that trend, that... Um, those, those disappointments um, is, is um, really, really uh, is troubling. And so we have a lot of work to do as a league. Um, sure, how we debrief metrics and um, resumes and kind of what has happened, how we schedule, right? 20 league games, more or less um, non-conference schedule. Again, I know Brad covered on some of that, but um, view from an after action standpoint as a league, let alone for Clemson, um, that there's a lot to a lot to review there. I've talked to Commissioner a lot, talked to him leading up to uh, Selection Sunday, talked to him last night for a while. Um, he was great. I know he reached out to Brad as well, another conference office staff member. Um, as far as the just the disappointment and frustration with I've heard from a handful of other ADs in our league and out of, um, gosh, yeah, that doesn't seem right. You know, and um, and those have been, that's all, that's, that's uh, supportive. It kind of gives you affirmation of maybe what you, what you think, let alone we see the talking heads and ESPN and Billis and, and those folks talk about the, um, the, the, the tournament worthy teams, tournament teams, and, and just have a lot of conviction that that's, that's um, what, was, what was earned, to use Hunter Tyson quote, um, this year and, and kind of who we are. Um, so the frustration of that is where we're at, but I know Brad's certainly getting the guys ready and excited to play Wednesday night and hopefully uh, two more home games after that and beyond, um, you know, after a great year 23 and 10 historic in a lot of ways for Clemson regular season three seed overall um, or three seed in the tournament um, and again a lot of those plat <coughs> platitudes of the season um, you know really pleased and and, and uh, pleased of what was accomplished and, and um, the, the team and the leadership of the team um, you know and excited to move forward with Brad with that he and I met this morning for uh, for a little while, and there's certainly obviously the season's not complete, so we have a lot of off-season discussions and planning to get into, no question. But um, no, from a support for him and a support and investment in our program, it's um, you know that we, we cover some of that. And why well, I wanted to huddle here with you guys and keep going. I know, obviously, uh, last year a lot of review of program status and hey, what's what's expectations and. Certainly, I um, you know put out a letter, put out some thoughts as it relates to expectations and investment, and um, how we continue to move forward um, with Clemson basketball. And so that still um, that still holds true. And last off season, this off season, I want us to continue to to plan for the NCAA tournament. Those were my words from um, from a year ago. And from an expectation standpoint, that, that'll always be, and quite frankly, I hope that maybe um, evolves into a, a, a minimum type of expectation for Clemson basketball. Um, and yeah, we weren't uh, selected last night, but I view us as a NCAA tournament team. And so the evaluation of where we're at as a program um, right now and what next year looks like and years ahead, that um, I'm excited for us to continue to invest um, in the program uh, men's and women's, and with Brad and support to um, to continue to to achieve postseasons and plan for postseason, plan for NCAA tournament, um, and continue to raise the bar of expectations. Um, and with that comes continued investment. Again, I know I, I, I linked and it was intentional to, um, to to have those public comments because there was a lot of questions of that. And I know a year ago I was three months on this job, and kind of how important is Clemson basketball? Um, and it's really important. And that was really the intention of, of the letter. And I'll 
reiterate that today. Um, we've shown um, areas of investment, staff, um, some things that are seen externally and, and kind of internal programmatic things, and we'll continue to do that. We're going to announce later this spring a new um, basketball operations project, a $40 million project um, that we'll, we'll um, send to the Board of Trustees. And uh, next month, we anticipate um, to expand our, our practice facility for men's and women's nutrition area um, facility investment for uh, for basketball. So that's another show, a significant show of investment. And so it's not a one-off season where you snap your fingers with staff and some things and now um, that's investment. It's a continuum and there'll continue to be a um, show of that from, um, from, from our administration towards basketball. And with that, um, the continued um, expectations of uh, success come with it. So I, Covered a lot of bases there, I, I know, or I hope, intentionally, um, of, of value, frustration from last night, evaluation of this year, and, and continued investment and expectations ahead. So um, let's let's dovetail from there. Where do you want to go? In, in terms of the non-conference, I know Brad had some great point comments about the ACC and feel like they didn't get enough help in terms of it's always the blue blood programs that get sent to the the MTEs, yeah, yeah MTEs tournaments and. You know, Clemson and, and teams at the bottom of the Big Ten and the ACC Big Ten are always paired together because that's where they, they're projected to finish. Like, have you shared those concerns with with the commissioner and just what's your sort of your take on that? Yeah, we taught. Yes, I have, and and that's um, I think one of the, the the benefits and have has I think helped my evaluation of where Clemson basketball is at and what's needed and what's ahead. That I you know have been here for ten years now, and so I've had that type of conversation with Brad. I've seen a prior role and, and now this role um, for quite some time, and, and with the league office. The, um, you know, and it's 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 just really interesting of, of how you, what's what's best for the league. How, do you support the middle and get more teams in? Do you really invest in the the more of the blue bloods and make sure they're getting great seeds? And the answer is all of it, right? Um, but that those those specifics of of scheduling of NTEs of matchups. Um, yeah, it, uh, often dialogue when Commissioner came, and this was a year ago, uh, two years ago maybe, and was making his tours around campus, um, had some specific sit-down time with Brad and Commissioner Phillips on, on these kind of topics for the league. So, um, you know, as I said, it, it, it's, it's concerning of the last couple of years with the league. Um, sure, as that ties to resources and investment and opportunity from, from a league standpoint, right, which is another topic that we're not – um, you know, we don't need to get into all of that today, but like I think it's all interconnected, and so I think the um, the push and the the, the support from uh, the league for all 15 teams, you know, there's all kinds of different ways to go about it, and obviously we feel like you know we're we're the short end here this year as relates to the tournament. Is there any optimism on your part just to get dialogue that that, that, that ever changes? That's not always Duke, North Carolina, or Virginia that's going to these these things. Yeah, I, I think so. I'm excited to see what our Big Ten matchup will be next year. We finished third. You know, and so if, if um, oftentimes, you know, you kind of match based on order of finish, not directly, but yeah. generally that's the flow from years past. Um, and so, you know, we finish third. And so next year, uh, you know, expect a, a, a pretty high level Big Ten matchup. Anytime you get this late in somebody's tenure, uh, there are camps that, that, that form. And of course, there are going to be, there's going to be the camp that says the bottom line is, is three tournaments in 13, in 13 years, and the supposedly clear expectation going into this year was NCAA tournament. So how do you, that's your constituent, part of your constituency, yeah, I sure. guess. So how do you respond to that? Yeah. Um, no doubt, again, plan for NCAA tournament, and I hope to always be in a position with the program that that's a legitimate off-season discussion, plan, and expectation. It was last year, and it will be this year. And that's not the case for every program um, or every offseason. Um, so that's part of the calculus of, of where our program's at. That, like, that's legitimate discussion for from last year. And, and again, tournament team, in my opinion, and as we embark on this offseason. And so we're going to continue to do that. Um, you're right, Larry, I, you know, no doubt. Um, 13 years, and, and you can't, it's, it's body of work, and, and you can evaluate the, um, the full tenure, it's necessary. 
you know, and, and so you can't split ten, the, the tenure. I got it. But there's there's been a clear, you know, even just investment within the facility and Little John and operations, and not that that means there's one chapter of a tenure and the second chapter is totally different. But but if you do look at the last five or six years and two tournaments, two first fours out and should have been in, um, you know, I, 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 I certainly assess the, the last – five or six years, I don't have all the stats of our conference winning percentage and things like that, but it's really good. It's really good. And so I think that's where, from a, from a current moment, where the program's at now, it's taking into account the full tenure, no question, where the program's at now and what the, what the immediate future looks like, um, let alone the, the, the more recent past, I feel really um, confident and excited about where we sit. And again, if you look at it for a full 13 years, um, I can understand different perspectives, but from current status and this off season and in recent history, um, I think that that story is something that should be really compelling for all of us. I'm sure that uh, with, as, as Larry said, the different the different camps kind of aligning themselves. You know, you, you wanted to, to get this out uh, to kind of take the pressure off Brad. But you know, when did you say to yourself, you know, hey, I'm not going to do anything. I'm not going to make a change. And, and did you tell Brad? And kind of how did that conversation go? Just so. He's not coaching with a with a cloud over his head. That's right. Yeah, um, I don't know, David, that there was one um, one game, one win, one moment that it was like, hey, we're staying the course. Certainly, you know how we've played throughout the season, let alone the last one four out of five regular season at NC State. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of there, there was a lot of the continued momentum as we close the season. You know, right now, like I said, that early this morning, seven something. Um, the, the morning after the tournament, not because that was a make or break decision, but because of, um, you know, quite frankly, it was um, how we continued to focus on the NIT, but quickly move into off-season planning because transfer portal opened today, right? Um, and and staff and recruiting and, and all those type of transitions. So just wanted to quickly um, get ahead of it with Brad or and have a conversation with him. Like, how's, how's, how's he feeling? What are, what are his, some of his um, perspective and, and, and immediate feedback? Again, we have a lot more to cover, and we will, but wanted to, um, to quickly huddle with him and, and, again, with you guys just to um, be able to, to move forward with what, um, again, I think to be a really successful year and get into off season, end of the season and then off season planning for the tournament next year. What was his message about kind of, I guess, him wanting to stay here, wanting to be the head coach, and kind of where he feels like the program is right now. Yeah, um, heavy perspective again on some of the, um, the the current health of the program, and you get all the off the court stuff, which I think has been and, and I'll further it of just how Brad runs the program, and I I, I I know we don't take that for granted, but it's um, he's been so consistent with that compliance, academics, former players, doing it the right way. Um, that that's just it, it's just that gives you so much of a foundation of which to build upon the competitive <coughs> success. Excited for what, how the roster focuses next year. Certainly, transfer portal, our NIL program, and support of our current roster. All that, how that points to um, you know a positive trend line to next year. Um, you know, and I get excited about where we're at with him. He has three years left on a con on his contract. Um, expect us to to continue in that in that state in that status. Um, and have a heck of a year next year. So, no, is this going to stay the same as from this past year? Is that the plan for contract? -wise? Contract. Um, yeah, I don't anticipate to um, to uh, feel like three years, and um, that's where we'll, we'll continue to focus and be able to recruit and and have a heck of a year next year. So, don't, don't expect to to um, alter that at this point. As you talked about the new operations center, are there any other? Areas you feel like you could invest further, whether it's, whether it's recruiting budget, whether it's an assistant coach pool, things like that. What things do you feel like you could do? Yeah, um, there's actually, John, a um, NCAA, this is uh, February, maybe January, um, changed some of their accountable coach rules. So now there's actually two additional coaches for men's and women's basketball. This is a, a national thing that can be on the court. And you can effectively, not that they allow you to hire new you can hire staff members, but that can be on the court to, to train and um, develop and coach. And so, you know, uh, it's one of the things we talked about this morning, like, hey, we need to talk about that and what that looks like. If, do we add another staff member or two? Um, and if that's how uh, we need to do it competitively or how Brad has a plan for, and Amanda, from a women's basketball standpoint, supplies there too. And we would look to 
um, make that available there too. If, if from their leadership standpoint, have a have a role, have a need, and so um, so yes, yeah, staffing. I guess specifically because this off season is a different one. Um, if we look to add more staff or not, we'll get into that conversation. Um, yeah, assistant coach pool. We certainly made big strides with that last year, um, and and feel that we are in a much better place than we've been in years past. But as it looks to retain coaches, uh, assistant coaches, we're going to continue to um, to to be aggressive there. And the facility piece, is, as you said, is a big one. And that's, that's a facility, right, we'll have, have to get, um, it's a $40 million facility, so there's approvals and board and state, so we won't break ground on that for quite a while, for at least not this year. Uh, but there'll be some other internal facility pieces that we'll do um, from, you know, graphics and some other uh, weight equipment and things like that. What would it be, you know? Yeah, so uh, did we have some designs, David, actually on the, the IPTE corner. Um, or the corner opposite IPTE, and essentially just kind of adding an additional operations and practice facility, and then kind of in the middle and adjoining nutrition uh, training table area. Where those parking spaces are, kind of. Uh, oh, gosh, you had to go there. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, great. It's, it's great real estate, but we want it to still be a, certainly a connected facility and connected with Little John and and um, connected with the women's or with the, with the practice facility. Now, since we'll have two men's and women's practice facility. Um, and right, that's so they have their distinct areas, and now with gymnastics starting next fall, gymnastics from a setup and meet standpoint will take um, time off of the main court. And so now having an additional court, practice court, given that we're adding a sport um, to the, the broader facility is important. So again, that's not a that's not a snap of finger, but we started the design of that and the fundraising of that facility about a year ago. Uh, and we're at the point now to have the financing plan and plan to fundraise dollars in place and move that forward for approvals and ultimately construction. I know NCAA tournament's always a goal. When you look at stability with a program, and I think 10 straight winning seasons, and you see kind of other places where maybe they've made a change and it hasn't gone so well. Does, does having that stability, does that play a factor some? I think there's a, um, I'll, I'll maybe answer it in two different lenses. Um, I think the, this, the, the, the high floor, call it, um, basketball is, it's, it's five players play, your roster's, you know, 12 to 13, like between injuries, between wrong guy transfer, wrong guy go pro, so to speak, and men's or women's tournament too. Like the stability is an underrated value, I think, that, that Brad's created, a good ball coach, you know, and you're right, now you look at other places and, and been more, it had been inconsistent. Um, and it's just it's just hard to sustain that level of, of um, achievement. Um, that being said, like the that doesn't that doesn't um, mitigate or govern the the aspirations for higher level achievement. You know, so it's it's I, I kind of answer that of like yeah, stability significantly valued, but not from a passive sense. Like it's that's really valued significantly in any program, let alone basketball and how Brad leads. Um, but also have have uh, expectations, aspirations to, to raise the bar. Um, so I, I think both can be true. It's not like you, you settle for one level of stability and that mitigates higher aspirations. I, I view both to be true here. Do you feel like y'all had any anyone in the actual room? Like I know you said you heard from 80s out around the country. Do you feel like there was anyone in the actual room that was kind of fighting on Clemson's behalf? Or, or yeah, you know, I, I, yeah, the ACC. Um, Monitor was uh, Charles McClellan, who's the commissioner of the um, the SWAC, and then um, Bob Cunningham, who's the ACC representative on the committee that has to be recused when, him, um, at least when his team's um, being talked about. And obviously, with North Carolina being in the, the um, first four out, like Clemson, you know, I think there was probably a lot of times where he wasn't in the room um, when schools like us, because North Carolina was also kind of in that on the bubble, so to speak. Um, you know where that uh, where that that seemingly is kind of how things transpired. So um, you know, but through our league office, like again, we 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 um, significantly pushed the you know everyone had well good luck politics. Well, it's not really politics. It's just making sure context, circumstances of our season or games or roster are known and well known and high, is certainly we're highlighting our our attributes and metrics. So that's what it was. But we were very comprehensive. Um, uh, amongst all areas that we thought could could really affect it. What was your reaction to Carolina being out of you guys? Yeah, uh, a little surprised. 
Um, yeah, I was surprised. Um, but I think we were um, kind of the tail of two cities, <laughs> um, right, where I know one of our wards was our non-conference strength of schedule. But our, our head-to-heads and our um, finishing the league and league record um, compared to North Carolina had um, one of the best non-conference <coughs> strength of schedules. And obviously their records in, in the league wasn't as good. So I think we're both maybe a, a, a victim of the extreme a little bit on, on either side of it. So if you and Brad talk or will you guys talk, I guess if the committee is weighing the strength schedule so heavily, like it seems that they are about reassessing your approach to non-conference scheduling and maybe what you guys can do. I know some of that you don't necessarily control. Right, yeah. I, I mean, yeah, so I think you have to. Like, it, we, we, I mean, we've talked about it a bunch already, but yeah. just kind of like a little bit in arrears, and your question is more of like, hey, how, how is that going to affect yeah. your next season kind of scheduling strategy? And so, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, so much of scheduling is managed by the staffs. Like, I get football scheduling. Athletic directors usually drive that strategy in concert with your with your football coach, of course. That's at least how we do it here. Um, basketball scheduling is more driven by your basketball coaching staff. Um, and, and, and we certainly communicate and in concert. But now, like, the, the strategy, the analytics of it, yeah, we need to take some time in the offseason to look at that. I don't think there's any revisionist history of how we did this. I know Brad talked on the – you know, TCU, Cal situation, and obviously South Carolina, who play every year. Um, but I do think, Davis, it's a, uh, um, you know, again, as a league, like we're going to take some time talking with commissioner, like in this, this next coming weeks, and then our spring meetings where head coaches and ADs are together, and whether we bring in some experts or otherwise, just to kind of talk on some of the, the, the analytics of it. Um, yeah, that's absolutely needed. Is it, is it, go ahead. Is it safe to say that? You, you had a feeling even before the tournaments that, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna stick with him. That the, the decision was essentially made uh, before that. Yeah, I yeah. certainly felt very much um, uh, heading in that direction. Just kind of buoyed off of the, the the season and the success. And you know, I, I, to your point earlier, Larry, I think you're friends with Camps and David. Like I gotta understand it. Um, you know, but for those of us that were games, a lot of games in Little John this year, like apathy or fan, you know, uh, camps, like there's a bunch of games in there this year that uh, apathy wasn't a word in there. Um, I got the picture in my office already printed and hung up with the Duke game, you know, and that's Duke, I got it. But Miami, Florida State, NC State, um, Virginia Tech, like so many sold out. We, we our, I don't know the exact stats, Jeff, but we had a, our average attendance this year was higher than last year. Uh, from a financial standpoint, we exceeded our um, plans for season ticket sales and single game sales. So, like, because those from a business lens, right, which is certainly part of my job, like, those are those are um, metrics, <laughs> funny word, metrics that you're that, that are important to the to decisions of, of any program and. You know, I just think this past year and where we're at um, from a program standpoint, like those things continue to, to track in a in a in a good um, direction, and we want and, and you know need to win. Um, and obviously, a lot of it <coughs> has the season built and saw a lot of great environments, and we're going to need to do our job and quite frankly a better job from a marketing awareness, in-game experience side of things, um, specifically for basketball preseason and in season. So. Um, so that that topic that I that I, I, I get asked about from time to time of of um, you know just concern of energy or apathy of the program. I mean, I think you couldn't have gone to um, if you went to games in Little John, you, you would that would not be the sense. I mean, quite frankly, the opposite. There was a lot of there's a lot of excitement and, um, and momentum from, from the in-game and, and support standpoint of the program. You get the feeling it's almost better to go. Four and six, or five and five against quad one and two, then ten and zero oh against quad three. You know, you t- like Brian and I talk about that a lot. And again, I know he gave that example of TCU versus Cal, and we beat Cal. When we were twenty three and ten. Um, it's kind of like, well, hey, had we uh, matched up against TCU, they're really good. Maybe we don't win that game, so we're twenty two and eleven. But does the metrics of that, which kind of your point, does that sway? You know, are the the net and the strength of schedule? Um, you can't help but question that at this point. Yeah. I know Brad and some other coaches have talked about, like, we don't know exactly what the committee is prioritizing when they're evaluating teams. Like, have you talked to the committee or tried to contact them to have a conversation of, okay, what is it exactly that, that you yeah. want, want to see or what's what are the most important 
parts of this. Yeah, one of the things that um, Chris Reynolds, the chair, um, said last night in his Q&A um, on CBS was that, I forget the exact phraseology, but that they don't talk about eye tests. Um, and that one just, that, 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 that was a tough one to hear. And I get it, like you gotta be objective, there's 300 and however 50 something teams and not all the committee members can watch all the games, it's different than football, I understand that. 68 teams you see, but you know, at some point, I think that's what resonates with Phyllis and some of the ESPN folks that we've certainly heard a lot from, is that like, like you watch the games, you watch Clemson, like that's a tournament team um, with the margin of victories, et cetera. So, um, and, and, and who would be, and off, not, off nice, no doubt. Can't dismiss the losses that we had that certainly hurt us and, you know, um, no doubt, just got to win. But, I, you know, I think that certainly stuck with me. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll debrief, like no, a couple other committee members on there well. You know, at some point it does get into, you gotta, um, our, our strategy was over the past couple of weeks to be really direct and pointed with certain, not necessarily committee members, but kind of those that you think could affect the circumstance. So it's not like we're blanketing or sending, um, sending um, wide ranging things, but I think there will be some, um, some debrief, certainly as a league, but then also um, kind of in one on one settings of, of kind of, hey, how things went, what, what are some of the prioritization of things that we maybe missed, and then ultimately linking it to one of your prior questions of like, hey, how does that affect our strategy, scheduling, expectations for, for next year? Yeah. Have you got any more? I know we're, we're coming up here on all of In the constructive things. sort of give and take between you and Brad, is it a. Uh, I mean, is, is the takeaway from this season, yeah, we should have made it, but, man, it, it, it'd be nice to not be 50-50, to not have that feeling going in, and dang, when the stars align like they did this year <clears throat> with the talent and the maturity and leadership and all that, you'd like to be a shoe-in and not have to stress on, on, on Sundays, on that Sunday. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, your, your, your point's a good one, Larry, of like, gosh, for all the excitement throughout the year, a lot of the stuff you guys have written about, like, hey, this is, this, this is, a, this is a good ball team. And then, yeah, it gets to the point of the stress on Sunday and then obviously on the wrong side of it. You know, and we talk about, like, great leadership, right? Hunter Tyson, Cat, and, and those type of things. And Hunter and Brevin are, are graduating. Um, and I know there'll be other roster changes, but like, you know, so, but the notion of being old, like I, it, it anticipate us to be old again next year. It's not like this was an old team and oh, now we're resetting, right? That's part of the, part of the calculus here that like, with what's come PJ, expect to be back, certainly Chase, um, a lot of the freshmen that'll be sophomore, big difference there, right? And certainly the other, you know, other upperclassmen that, that we expect to be back. So, um, so I'm not picking at the stars of line comics. I, I totally sure. understand. Like, you know, we had a lot of, you know, good um, end of game execution and things like that. It doesn't always go your way. But um, but I, I do think that, you know, the, the the program build, the roster build that where Brad's at for this year, yeah, there was a lot to like, but I have those expectations for next year to be a lot of like. And I'm sure they'll be active in the in the transfer portal and we'll get some other old guys in addition to the roster um, critical pieces being older. Um, so I think the opportunity <coughs> for the stars to align again next year, and then to your point, being at the point where you're not sweating on Sunday is certainly uh, a big part of the, uh, the, the aspiration. Yeah. Sort of a big picture question here, but when you, when you look at programs like in Alabama, where a lot of people like, well, they're football first, they're about all programs always going to take a back seat to that, it's going to be mediocre, and you see what they've done the last handful of years, yeah. even a program like Miami, what they've done with their basketball program last year, does that, you do look at that, and, and does that change, I guess, maybe how you view the floor of, of your basketball program, maybe expectations to that to some degree? Yeah, it's a really good question, and yeah. <clears throat> you know, think about that a lot, and I'll maybe tell a quick, I don't know if it's a story, but there's perspective on it. Because um, I am incredibly, uh, incredibly convicted on our athletic program, our brand, facilities now, certainly basketball, but like just our portfolio. Um, and IL is a big part of that too, you know, and our NIL resources and collectives in the community. And a lot of times those are, you know, those are probably maybe more vibrant for bigger football programs like Clemson. So I think like the perspective from the industry of our job um, is, uh, is is really different than maybe it's been in, in decades past. Um, my, my story uh, or my, my perspective is, 
you guys know my alma mater is Georgia Tech. Georgia Tech, love, love hoops, a lot of tradition, two Final Fours, national championship game, like um, Atlanta. And I would tell you, when I was growing up in Atlanta and at school at Georgia Tech, like, I, you know, my lens was Georgia Tech basketball is a different, you know, better, uh, whatever you call it, job than maybe Clemson basketball. I, I think um, now with, with what we've supported basketball with, men's and women's, the continued investment that I'll continue to preach um, on that, and again, my basketball background, sure, like, I, you know, I have those aspirations. So I, I, I think that um, the the level of achievement that Clemson basketball can reach is never been higher, much higher than what it's been in the past. And then even, I'm linking it back to your question, to some of the other schools maybe more like us, football, um, you know, success or otherwise, that I think that's, a, that's an example of that. And so, yeah, like I think um, that us to achieve that level of top national consistent success is absolutely doable here, has, has happened in spurts in the past. Um, but I think it's, it's going to be part of like how our investment will continue to, to support that and have expectations of that. All right, guys. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate it. Thanks, sir. Thanks, guys. If you're in the Columbia or Sumter or PD areas and you're in any way interested in buying and selling a home, commercial property, land, need to consider reaching out to Uptown Realty. They're based out of Sumter and run by a friend of mine, Patrick Enzer, big Clemson guy, used to cover the Tigers in a newspaper capacity, longtime supporter of Tiger Illustrated, longtime listener to the Dubcast. The home buying process should be an enjoyable experience, so let Patrick and his staff do all the heavy lifting. All you got to do is pick up the phone and call 803-774-0435 or go to UptownRealtySC.com. Another loyal supporter of the Dubcast is the Blackacre Law Firm in Greenville, a subsidiary of Parm Smith & Archenthold. Blackacre helps South Carolina residents achieve their dreams of home ownership by providing experienced, professional representation for real estate closings. Attention to detail is crucial in real estate law. Blackacre is committed to making sure nothing gets by them preparing residential or commercial closings. Blackacre also offers estate planning services for their clients in the Greenville area. Find out more about Blackacre at 864-326-35. Want to share a quick word about Founders Federal Credit Union? If you've been to a sporting event in Clemson, you've probably heard about Founders already. They are the official credit union partner of the Clemson Tigers. In addition to that, all Clemson faculty, staff, and students are eligible for membership as well as IPTA members. Matt Gross is a proud Clemson alum and the vice president for the Clemson market for Founders Federal Credit Union. Matt's office is located beside the Walmart neighborhood market on Old Greenville Highway in Clemson. For more information, go to foundersfcu.com. Dot com. Okay, some interesting comments earlier this week from Miles Murphy and Joseph Ngata at Pro Day. Both guys seemingly wistful for the college days that they left behind. Really interesting stuff in the context of Dabo always reminding his players incessantly, hey, these are the best days of your life. These are the days you're going to cherish 10, 20, 30 years down the road. So it's interesting to see when that dawns on folks like Murphy and Ngata. And in in Gata's case, it seems like he's maybe all but saying, "Ah, I wish I would have come back. Anyway, you can be the judge. We'll start with Miles Murphy and then in Gata. Here we go. Uh, Really, it was literally the night before the D-line was supposed to perform at the combine. I was working on 10-yard starts and honestly just pulled a little little bit too hard and felt just a little tweak in my hamstring and knew I wasn't going to be 100% to run the time that I know I can run. So that, that was that was really the biggest reason why I'm kind of just holding off until April right now. You feel like in April you will be? Oh, for sure. What's kind of your, your goal time? Goal time, sub, four, five, five. That's the goal time right there. Uh, better than expected, honestly, because I going going up to it, especially my uh, sophomore year, I would ask a lot of guys that went through it or that were currently going through it what it's like, and out they were like, "Oh man, it's a whole bunch of meetings, this, that, and the other. Uh, they, I can't eat what I want to eat. Um, I'm only eating vegetables and fish every day. And honestly, I grew up on vegetables and fish, so that's that wasn't a big change for me, but. 
honestly, this entire process, I'm out in uh, Phoenix, Arizona, specifically North Scottsdale area, which is a beautiful, beautiful area, and really just enjoying it, honestly. Uh, seeing my body change, I'm in a, a great, a better body. I feel great, uh, feel fast, feel strong. And, like, the entire process at the Combine with the interviews, I got there. That at the combine, that was a that was a, a, a different process. It was everything was back to back. First night I got there, I had eleven interviews back to back. I, it was a lot at first, but honestly, the entire process, I'm just enjoying it, having fun, really. Miles, are you a uh, are you a mock draft guy? Do you spend your time spend time looking at where you might be projected, and then do you either get upset or happy about what you see? Uh, not, not really. Uh, of course I do have family members where they see in there, they're like, I'm from Atlanta and there was a mock draft that my mom saw and she got excited. It said I was mocked to number eight to Atlanta and she was like, Oh, you might stay home. And I was like, okay, that's, that's cool to see. But I try, me personally, I try not, I try not to look at it because I don't want it to be like, Oh, if I'm mocked number one overall, okay, I'm satisfied or I want, I want my work you know, to say the same and, you know, keep my head level, really. Oh, man, I met with the Steelers last night, Patriots. Uh, I met with, oh, met with the Ravens. Uh, those those are three teams that I met with last night. Uh, what about to say, I had a few conversations with the Giants, Giants D-line coach, um, uh, Honestly, all, every every conversation been a good conversation. Honestly, just really wanted to get to know my background, get to know my personality, and get really getting to know each other. Yeah. When you still like improve and you got your workout April and things throughout this process, what do you feel like you still want to show? Like How fast I really am. Like a lot of people, they 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 see the speed that's on the that's on the field, but I don't think a lot of that speed is really recognized as far as. What it actually is. Mm. The junior, junior film, I guess. What, what do you feel best about? You know, looking back on. The uh, really, just being disruptive. Honestly, uh, but I say I know a lot of people do look at the stats, and I know the stats may not reflect the type of player that I am. But honestly, week to week, uh, watching the film, just being just that disruptor, uh, knowing that O lines are having a slide to you. Uh, motion the back over to your side to get a chip block. Anything that gets the quarterback O line or, or especially the offensive coordinator to think about you uh, at the beginning at the beginning of the week, you know, I enjoy that. I like just being disruptive, and that's the biggest thing that I, that I can appreciate this past season. Oh man, a hard worker, a competitor. Someone most definitely someone that's going to push the people around him. So whatever team he goes to, he's going to push everyone in that D line group because that's that's a guy. That's a we call it plug and play. Uh, that's a plug and play guy. You draft him, put him onto the field. He can play today, and he's most definitely going to challenge everyone in that D line group. So that's that's the type of person you're going to get when you draft him. I was like family. It wasn't. It wasn't anything that we had to. Oh, we got to make sure we we do this. Like, no, this is something that we want to do. We set it. We we set aside time to. I said, Coach Coach Sweeney and all the uh, faculty set did a great job of setting aside the practice time so that Brian, his family, and a lot of his close friends on the team, so that we we could all go up to his uh, sister's funeral and. Everything was everything was uh, smooth. The entire Ella Strong movement was easy. It was, it just I don't know. It it, it flowed like it wasn't anything that it was like okay. It obstructed anything. It it was it was really just something that we all wanted to do. It just felt right to do, honestly. Yeah, opting out of the Orange Bowl. You know, who all did you talk to to make that decision? Mm -hmm. and, um, uh, really, I wasn't even thinking about opting out until maybe a week before the game because I was just, I was just, you know, keeping my head down, working, playing, and then it was, you know, 
parents parents that came up to me just like a, a thought like are you thinking about uh playing in the in the orange bowl or up down the orange bowl and that was that was really the first time I actually like oh this is a, a a legit question and you know I had a conversation with my parents uh family extended family uh some, some of my teammates uh went to some of my position position coaches and you know overall a lot of them just said it makes sense that that's that's the right that's the right move that's the move that makes sick that, that's the move that makes sense right now and they made it easier for me to go go forward with that decision oh it was difficult even thinking about it it was weird when i got on the phone with coach sweeney and said it it was i don't it was it was a weird gut feeling uh about to see gags my parents i was I was almost, I was almost to myself for those two weeks when that when, when, when my team flew down to Miami and were practicing that entire week, and it really hit me when I was, I was at my grandparents' house watching the game, and I'm about to say all of my brothers they're out there playing, playing, you know, the game that they love, and I'm at my grandparents' house just watching it, and it, it was a weird feeling for sure, and. But I, I just know, with my family, with my family uh, backing me on my decision, they they really did help me through that. Mm-hmm. Grandparents in the Atlanta area. You've been working for. What? Grandparents in the Atlanta area. Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. This is something you've been working for your entire life. I'm just curious what it feels <laughs> like to be this close to finally hearing your name called. Uh, honestly, surreal. About to say I'm, I'm not honestly not even caught up to this moment yet. I'm still. I'm still like, I'm still back in Phoenix right now, uh, just training and really, pro day came like that. Uh, it's not, it's only just it's a real feeling and excited, nervous. I'm having all the feels right now, so it's really hard to explain right now, honestly. Uh, a little bit when I first came back here. When I flew, well, yeah, when I first came back here on this past Sunday. Um, but I saw, I saw the facility, saw the, saw my guys again, and it was like, oh, like I'm actually gone. I got, I had that wake up moment when I went up, went up to the front door, and put my fingerprint in, and it wasn't working. So, I was, yeah, that was that was a big like wake up call. Like you're, you know, your time here is done. So. Uh, most definitely, I did reflect on it a little bit when I came home from the facility and just you know saw the picture. We we have like pictures of pictures up on my uh, parents' wall in the house of my entire career in Clemson when when I first came here my freshman year. Some pictures when I was being recruited here to this past season, and you know it's 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 a it's a it's a good feeling to know that. Of course, my time here is done, but I can come back anytime. That's, that's honestly just a good feeling, though. Say so one more time. As far as 30 visits go, I only have the Saints right now on April 14th, but I'm sure more are going to line up. With that workout that you guys scheduled in April, what is the full game? Uh yeah, uh, well of course forty. If the there's there's gonna be scouts, coaches flying in. So if it's something that they want with the L drill, five ten five, uh, position position specific drills, I'm gonna be doing whatever they want to see. I'm gonna be showcasing that. So if it's that, if that's four three defensive end, three four outside linebacker stuff, I'm gonna be doing both of those things. Hmm. Uh, really, the biggest thing is really versatility. That's the biggest word right there. And versatility being the speed, speed aspect, uh, get off of, with the ball, power, extremely strong. I play anywhere from the three tech all the way out to the nine and dominated in, in each gap. And also dropped in coverage, hook drops, flat drops, curl drops, palms drops. 
and you know cover the back out the backfield, having to run him down forty yards down the field. So I've really done a little bit of everything and dominated in each one of those. Who wants to go first? What did you want to show uh, here today? Kind of what was your goal? Uh, I just want to play, come out here and play football. Um, apparently, I couldn't do certain things, and I just want to prove people. I wanted to prove to people that I can do it. It's not necessarily about proving anybody wrong or proving anybody right. It's just showing what I can do. At the end of the day, it's all business. I understand that, and I just wanted to show what I could do. So. How would you grade your performance today? Probably a C plus. Uh, <coughs> I'm the type of person I feel like I could do a lot of things better. Um, but I did everything I was supposed to do. I wish I could exceed those expectations. But at the end of the day, I'm putting my best foot forward. I'm going to keep working and keep going. So, what kind of feedback might you have heard from some of the NFL scouts? Um, they said I look good, but honestly, I thought I thought I could have done a lot better. Um, I really appreciate them coming out here and um, just evaluating me. I feel like that's a big part of this process. Not even, and it's crazy because not a lot of people get all 32 teams out to their pro day. So. I'm just really appreciative of them, and I just wanted to. I'm, they said I did good, but I want to show more in the upcoming future. What's the one thing that you're thinking about that maybe you could have done better? Um, just to smooth out my breaks. Um, I thought I was pretty smooth, but I just want to be more fluid. I know I'm be going against the best corners in the league, um, the the big names, and I just want to be ready to go against them day one. I want to be ready to compete and be ready. So. Were there any goals that you had for yourself that you did accomplish today? Um, get through, not get through today, but just finish today. Um, there's not really a lot of goal setting I had for this. I just wanted to be smooth. I wanted to be crisp. Um, it sounds bad that I didn't have any goals set for today, but I just wanted to show them that I could do what I do. So, what's the feedback that you know your group is getting from the NFL day two, day three? Where do they see you kind of slot in? Um, it's just varies with the teams. Um, only God knows where I'll, where I'll go. Whatever happens, happens. As long as I get an opportunity to show what I could do on a team, I'll be fine wherever I land. Um, it don't matter if I just get my foot in the door. I can, I can take it from there. Have teams asked you specifically about any of your injury history or anything there might be concerned about? Yeah, it's a, lot of, it's a lot of teams that ask me about injuries, and um, I cleared everything out. The MRIs, um, my body's full to go 100%. Um, MRI, CT scans, DEXA, whatever they wanted to see, I was open to do, and I did it. And I was, came out fine. I look good. Um, I feel great. I'm ready to keep going, keep working on my body, um, keep elevating, and I'm, I'm ready to show it. Do you feel like that's the most important thing for you, is just just being available for things? Yeah, of course. That's, that's the number one thing for everybody. It's just availability. Um, best ability is availability. And I feel like if I just keep working on my body, I'm going to be uh, in a good spot where I don't get hurt anymore. So. Did you consider it all maybe coming back now that you are finally healthy and kind of showing what you can do for, for one more season? Or I guess, what was that kind of thought process like? Um, It's just, I don't, I don't really know how to f- feel about that. I just, whenever I make a decision, I pray about it. Um, talk to my family about it. Talk to my friends about it. Uh, obviously, a lot of people wanted me to come back, but at the end of the day, I can't take back what I did. I can't take back anything. Now I'm just moving forward, looking forward. Uh, like everybody says here, the best is yet to come. So if I'm looking backwards, it's not really going to help me or benefit me. Um, I lo- Like when I came back here, I, I really, honestly, I'm going to just keep it up. Like I really, it was sad that I left. Like I felt sad when I was leaving, but I feel like it was the best thing for me to do. Um, and I just, I did what I did and I just went. I'm not looking back, have faith. I have faith in myself, and that's all I did. So. Did you feel like you did prove some things last year with, with your play and some big games that you had? Um, yeah, I, th- I felt like I proved some stuff. Um, there's always some more I could have done. Um, uh, but at the end of the day, whatever I showed, I showed. Can't, like I said, I can't take anything back. Too late to even reconsider, too late to even look back. Um, so I'm just, my best, my thing is, Looking forward, getting better every day, 1%, getting my body right, um, weight room speed, everything, catching, ball skills, contested catch, everything. That's all I'm looking forward to. Uh, I'm going to try to come back here as much as possible. Uh, if I'm welcome, I'm welcome. If I'm not, I'm going to be, I'm going to 
come in a hoodie. So, <laughs> that's just me. But when, when you say it was, it was sad, what was what, what specifically was it about that that made you feel that way? Just my friends, like all my friends stayed. And I just, I live it here. I felt like when I came back, I felt like I was doing what I was supposed to do. Like I was in the bistro yesterday. I'm like, all right, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. You know? I just felt like with my way of life, uh, everything else feels so foreign. But here it feels like home. It feels like regular when I'm here. So it's sad that I left. It's sad leaving friends, but business is business at the end of the day. And I'm, I just have to take care of business. All that, all the friends and everything come later. I'll hand out. We can, when the offseason comes, we'll get together, be, in, be somewhere, uh, Dominican Republic, Puerto Rico, Miami. So we'd be somewhere, but at the end of the day, business, business, they got to get ready for their season. I got to get ready for my upcoming season. So, where are you training? Um, I was training in Bomberitos in Miami, Florida, but uh, I'm about to be training in the Bay Area. So, in this process, so. Have you gotten, like, compared to any receivers or maybe some guys that you model your game after? Like, you know, when you're talking to NFL <laughs> scouts, have they said, oh, yeah, you remind me of this person or um, oh, this guy? Or... Honestly, I really think uh, I think uh, my game is smarter after uh, Mike Evans. Um, kind of see similar in what we do. Um, but I can get into the details, but it's just too many things. I mean, like, really detailed, so I could go on and on about Mike Evans, and I'll study him. Big fan of him and uh, what he does. So. What was kind of your goal to show today as far as just the route running part and catching and some of that kind of stuff, that part of the day? Mm-hmm. It was honestly a light day, but I just wanted to show I can get in and out of breaks. <coughs> uh, that was the biggest thing. I guess it was sticking out. I, I couldn't do that, so... That's just what I wanted to accomplish, what I wanted to show. Is there one team that you've talked to the most or shown what you think most interesting you at this point? Um, the Jets. I interviewed the Jets quite a bit. Quite a bit. Um, some other teams, but I've, I went from the NFL PA to the East West to Combine, so I mean, I've, I've talked to the teams a couple times, some three, four times. So. Do you feel like those first two performances maybe helped you get to the combine, or do you feel like you're good at the combine regardless? And you nah, I had the, com- I had the combine. Two. I had the combine like pretty gotcha. early, so it was. I had it before I went to the PA, and I, I think I had it before. I definitely had it before I went to East West. So I had it before PA. So. How, how those first two help you, maybe, if at all? I know, you know, some guys, a lot of guys don't do all three. So, how yeah, happen? I was honestly, I could. If they told me to go to Reese's, I would have went. Yeah, but I was ready to just ball. And I wanted to see, I want NFL scouts to see me up close in person, go and get the best competition. Um, that was just it for me. I just wanted to be, I wanted them to see me up close. I was being physical, fast. I want to see everything up close. And if that, they would have told me to do five weeks of football, I would have done it. So, let see. So, any receivers coming back here next year that you feel like we should watch out for? Them? Everybody. The big use? Watch everybody. I was at that practice two days in a row. Everybody's balling. Everybody's balling. So um, I'm not going to point out one in particular, but or two or three or four. But everybody seems to do good. The new offense is in great hands. Um, o line looks good. Uh, Davis Allen. I feel like everybody just is making strides, and everybody's buying into this process. So I feel like everybody's going to have a great year. Hopefully, everybody can eat. I want everybody to have a thousand yards. That's just how I am. I want everybody to eat some. Uh, Twenty thousand yards. Yeah. Did uh, how how difficult was it mentally to just handle it seemed like one injury after another and you just you know, not being able to stay healthy and stay on the field for for teams to see you know to put you know so much to put film out there for for teams. Um, it, I mean it's it tolls on the mind, but you know, at the end of the day you just gotta remember who you are. You gotta remember just where you come from. It's not about like, but you just have to bounce back. Life's hard for everybody. Yeah. And that's, I'm not going to say I'm tired about stuff, but I'm happy my last year I had no injuries. That was a big goal of mine. I accomplished it, so. Cool. Okay, appreciate the support of our sponsors for helping make this happen as always. And, of course, thanks to every one of you for hitting that play button. Really appreciate it. Cheers.